Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michael Butcher and the president of the Franco-British Lawyers Society. We aim to bring together the communities in France and the UK interested in machine learning and AI in all its modes and guises. We have a particular focus on younger people and make great efforts to be inclusive and diverse. Should any of you wish to help us, please email our General Secretary, Anne Biosch. Today, we turn our attention to justice. For those interested in seeing what other subjects we have covered, please take a look at our videos on our YouTube channel, to which where today's proceedings will also end up shortly. The French Embassy has been of huge assistance in getting us going these past four years or so, and I'm delighted that Estelle Crowe, the, Italian, the liaison magistrate who advises the French ambassador on the strange things British law gets up to, and also has an office in the Home Office to help with cross-border issues. Estelle is the rapporteur for today's proceedings. We owe her and her other colleagues our thanks in securing the involvement of the French Ministry of Justice, who are partnering us in this event. It is they that have persuaded Estelle Jean Necon, a member of the Cour de Cassation, the highest court in France, to join us today. Justice is, of course, a big topic and an area of endeavour that involves the generation, collection and consideration of vast amounts of disparate information or data at all stages of its endless processes. Endless because there is in respect of a vast number of parties and bodies, the application of the law that went before to new facts and circumstances as society evolves. And to this is added the new laws that the legislative bodies are reflexively constantly considering and producing. It is an area ripe for greater understanding through the application of algorithms and neural networks. One area of particular interest to me is a practical one. Can AI help politicians, judges, teachers, students, journalists, and the electorate in a democracy understand whether key policies and theories are actually delivering justice? Each of our speakers today will talk for about 10 minutes. There will then be a question session. Please feel free to use chat during the whole of the event to submit questions uh, so people have got a, a chance to think about them uh, in the minutes that are available. To kick off, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mathieu Lucchesi. He is a counsel, he is counsel at the leading international law firm, Gilles Loiret Noël, who have offices in both London and Paris and indeed elsewhere in the world. Mathieu will focus on the major trends in Europe regarding the use of AI and the associated risks in the private and public sectors and address the importance of having regulation at the EU level. Mathieu. Thank you very much for this introduction and for to all of you for your uh, presence today. I'm very delighted to participate in this session. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so indeed, um, uh, my, my, my objective is to use my 10 minutes talk to discuss with you and present you the discussions that are currently uh, having place at the European level on the introduction of a new regulation on artificial intelligence and the impacts that it can have on the use of AI in justice. To do so, I would like to share with you a couple of slides that I will try to let you see. Give me one second to share my screen. That should be it. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, perfect, great. Um, so indeed, uh, what I'm going to focus on during the next 10 minutes is the proposal made by the European Commission to introduce within the European Union a regulation on AI. 
As an introduction, I thought it could be interesting to share with you where this proposal comes from. Basically, starting in December 2019, the European Commission, with its new president and its new members, very quickly published their work program, highlighting the various priorities that they wanted to focus on during the next years. And within uh, this work program, the digital was seen as a strategic aspect for the European Commission. They really wanted to make everything possible to make sure that Europe was ready and best positioned in the world for what they call the digital age. Is my screen big enough or is it is it hard to see? Is it better like this? Okay. <laughs> so I think it's better like that. Like that, okay. Perfect. It's not filling my whole screen, so I'm not sure whether what everyone else is seeing. Maybe I can. Is it better? That's better. Yeah. That's better. That's better. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, starting 2019, we knew that the digital in the broad sense would be a key area for the European Commission for the next years. And in February 2020, the European Commission came up with the proposal to introduce in the European Union a regulation um, on artificial intelligence. But the European Commission, knowing that it was a very technical topic, started with the publication of a white paper. I don't know if you are familiar with this process, but Basically, the objective of white papers published by the European Commission is to share with the various stakeholders on a given topic their objective to reform um, a specific area of activity and to test um, with the various stakeholders their approach to introduce this new regulation. So this is what the European Commission did in February 2020 when it published a white paper on their proposal to regulate artificial intelligence in the European Union. And in this white paper, the European Commission made it very clear that its objective when working on the introduction on a new regulatory framework for, the arti for artificial intelligence was dual. It was first to really promote the use of AI and to make sure that the European Union was competitive at the international level in this area seen as strategic for the European Union. But at the same time, its objective is also to introduce a regulatory framework capable of addressing the specific risks linked or that this new technology could generate. And in this white paper published in 2020, it was clear that their objective was to define a regulation based on the risk that the use of AI could generate, basically, with the idea of imposing higher obligations for AI systems that was that were that could be considered as the riskier. So based on this publication, the European Commission received a number of feedbacks from the industry, from public institutions in various sectors. And based on these feedbacks, it published in April 2021 a proposal to introduce uh, regulation on AI in Europe. So it was not anymore a mere statement of intent as, is, as it was the case with the white paper, but here it's really the starting point of the legislative process at the European level to enact a new regulation on AI in the EU. And with the publication of this proposal, again, the European Commission made it clear that its objective were threefold, competitiveness, risk management, and support to innovation in the EU. 
So after this short introduction, we can go into the details of what this regulation could mean. Again, this is a proposal by the European Commission, so it's not effective yet, it's not binding at this stage, but it's the, the first step of the legislative proposal. And this legislative proposal has a very specific scope. It intends to regulate the placing on the market and the putting into service and use of AI systems. And this proposal specifically and precisely defines what would be covered by this main objective. In terms of stakeholders that would be covered and subject to, to this new regulation, several things are important to highlight. First, it is clear in the proposal that the objective for the European Commission is, to, is for this new regulation to apply to European stakeholders, but also to stakeholders that are located outside of the EU. But if their use of AI system can have an impact on the European markets. Here it is clear and it, and, and it is explicit in the proposal that the intention of the European Commission is to make sure that European ac actors and stakeholders are not subject to stricter obligation than their foreign competitors, competitors located outside of the EU. So here the objective is really to define the geographical scope of the regulation to make sure that it does not impede or um, impose higher a burden on European actors. It's quite important <coughs> because one of the few cases where the European institutions dare to impose obligations on market players and, and public institutions that could be outside of the EU. Another important aspect is that this new regulation would apply to all the stakeholders in the chain of value of AI. And by that, I, I mean that the draft regulation intends to impose obligations on providers of AI system, but also on distributors and users. So you see that there all the stakeholders in the chain of value of AI would be subject to new requirements. And as you have probably understood, the key elements to define the scope of application of this regulation is to understand what is meant by AI, since this regulation really targets AI systems. And you'll see, and I've reproduced it um, on the slide here, um, the artificial intelligence system that would be regulated under this new regulation is defined very broadly. So it's, it's any kind of software that is developed with one or more techniques listed in the regulation, such as knowledge-based approach, statistical approaches, machine learning, and so on. And that can, for a given set of human defined objectives, generate outputs such as content, predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing. So you'll see it's, it's a very broad definition. And that means that this draft regulation can have a significant impact on the AI market in Europe. Once we better understand the scope of application of this new regulation, it's also important to understand what, how it is structured. And here I have highlighted the very core principles that structure the new regulation. Basically, as, I've, as I have explained at the beginning of the presentation, the idea is to regulate AI systems based on the risks that they generate. And to reach this objective, the AI draft regulation basically classifies the AI systems based on the risks 
that they potentially can present, distinguishing between an acceptable risk AI system, high risk AI system, and low or minimal risk AI system. Mathieu, excuse me for interrupting. You're now at 10 minutes. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm way too long. So I'm gonna be quicker in the rest of the presentation. So the idea based on this, three categories is to define sets of obligation applicable to each of these categories. In a nutshell, an acceptable high risk, uh, an acceptable risk AI systems would be, would be prohibited. On the other hand, low or minimal risk AI system would not be regulated or very slightly regulated. The main obligations provided by this draft regulation on AI would be on AI system that are considered as high risk. And to know if an AI system is defined as high risk, you need to look at the list that is included in the draft regulation, which provides basically an, a, an exhaustive list of AI system that should be considered as high risk. And for our topic today, it's interesting to see that a number of AI system that can be used for law enforcement or administration of justice are explicitly targeted by this regulation. And I've reproduced a couple of examples that are explicitly cited in the regulation. So systems of AI used in justice are specifically targeted in, by this new regulation. Why is this important? Because if you're considered as a high risk AI system, you need to comply with quite a comprehensive number of obligations as providers, as distributor, or as user of this AI system. Typically, you have to put in place a risk management system to make sure that you control the risk generated by the AI system. You need to define an appropriate governance for the data you use in your AI system. You need to provide technical documentation on your AI system. So you see that there are a number of obligations that will be imposed for those AI systems to be used for law enforcement or administ administration of justice. So it can be quite impactful. To finish in the time I have, um, I wanted to insist on the fact that Everything I've described so far is again a proposal. It's the beginning of the legislative process and there are a number of steps uh, before the final enactment of this reform. But it is for sure a proposal to be followed carefully because depending on the final version of this text that will be adopted by the EU institutions, it will have for sure an impact on the AI system to be used for justice and the obligations that will be attached thereto. Thank you very much. Mathieu, thank you very much. I know you had a huge area to cover and that you managed it in only 13 minutes is a testament to your concision. Thank you very much. Uh, this now brings us to uh, Estelle Jean Necon, who is a judge and head of the open data system at the Cour de Cassation in France. Estelle will address the linked issues of the use to which data should be put, the need to create a legal framework and the associated risks. Uh, Estelle. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, do, uh, does everybody can hear me? Is it, uh, is it okay? Not very well. Not very well, but That's better. as I was afraid of. Is it, is it better? That's better. That's better. Okay, so thank you for having me and I'm very delighted also to be, to be here with you. I hope I will, uh, I will try to stay in my 10 minutes, so you can clock. And thank you, Michael, to remind me if uh, I'm too long. So briefly, uh, I want to start by um, uh, tell you uh, what the situation of the open data uh, of judicial court decision in France. Um, we, there was a law uh, in 2016 
uh, a law called uh, for digital republic, which was after that codified in 2000 and, uh, 2019, who uh, introduced the open data of judicial court in France. Then, um, by a decree in 2020, the court de cassation is declared um, responsible and in charge of the electronic dissemination of all the judicial court rulings. And that's very important. That's why I'm here today. Uh, by an order of um, April uh, 2021, the calendar of the open data of all the court decisions was set. And uh, finally, uh, with the decree um, of uh, September 30, 2021, uh, we created the automa automated data processing that we use at the court de cassation to do the open data, uh, which is called Judilida. The court de cassation has launched um, the online publicity of all its rolling uh, in September. 30, 2021, with a new website and a new case law search engine that we can open. And in um, one month now, uh, the open data uh, of all the court of appeal for civil, commercial, and social matters will be, uh, will be the first step will be uh, the open data of all the court rulings, uh, which is scheduled between June 2023 and December 2025. In order to think about the links between artificial uh, intelligence and justice, it is essential to understand why the French parliament chose to implement the open data in the digital field. The core reason is to ensure the transparency of justice and more globally, the transparency of democracy. By sharing all information on by the public authority and especially by the court. The goal is to strengthen the trust in the justice system and to create a better, a better legal predictability and it's also to offer a better knowledge of the justice for all people. With this goal in mind, and with that in mind, we have to understand that now there will be new tools created with all the decisions that we will put in open data. And this raises new questions, and in particular, we need to, to, to question ourselves on how the data, which will be available, will raise new kind of ethical challenges, challenges in the use of the data. And that will be my first point. And uh, also we need to focus on the fact that the new scale of dissemination of all the rulings might, might have an impact of the role of the judge, forcing us to anal analyze and question the concept and the purpose of case law in our French judicial system, different than yours. So, um, to understand the challenge of the ethical um, utilization of the judicial data, we need to remind uh, the legal framework of open data. According to the law, a judicial decision can be disseminated only if the personal information in the decision uh, are covered. The first names and surname of all natural persons are always covered, but the judges, the judge, who will rule in one decision can also decide himself or herself to remove all in identification data if he decides, or she decides that this data will arm the security of and the privacy of the natural people which are in the decision. And also we need to be reminded that um, uh, according to the law, it is not allowed to process identification data of judges and court clerks 
in order to, or in a way that, evaluate, analyze, compare, or predict the real or alleged professional habits. That being said, the use of the data of judicial court decision is considered to have a commercial value and is an important source for the law doctrine. New tools using algorithms will be created to assist legal professionals in their mission, whether it is lawyers or judges. Analysis the case law using artificial intelligence will be made of judicial court decisions disseminated in open data. This analysis may be sometimes presented as predictive. And this is why all the modalities of this new use is so important for us. This tool may have many advantages, such as, as I said before, reinforcing the legal flexibility uh, in the across the country, such as also speeding the proceeding or, gi or giving resources to individual and corporate entities to decide whether to settle or to go to the court. Nevertheless, there are many ways, many ways. The first one is even if our legal framework mandates the anonymization of the court decision, it remains a risk that individual can be identified through other information that is not covered, which leads to the question, how can we protect with efficiency the personal data open in physical <laughs> judicial decision that are in the judicial decision? And how can we balance all the protection of the natural person with the legibility of the decision? Besides, how can we take uh, into consideration the growing need of predictability of the law and court ruling? Is it often said that, as I said before, when you use the artificial intelligence with the open data of the court, you can reduce the burden of the court because you reinforce uh, the knowledge of the case law. But it also questions the question of the potential creativity break for judges. When a judge is confronted with all the analysis of several judicial decisions, even when it comes from its own court, how will it impact the judges on the way it will work and decide? It's what it's called, I'm sorry, the performativity of the decision. Another concern is the profiling of the judges, the court, the company, the lawyer that can be done by artificial intelligence. Even if the law bans the profiling, this prohibition is restricted to the judges and the court clerk, and the question remains for all the other bodies. Another challenge is the, the it's a technical challenge, and it's a technical challenge that us lawyers, we have to, uh, to tackle the challenge because this technical challenge is not minor, minor for the protection of the rule of law. First, the database that we will create, or everyone will create, legal tech, for example, have to, has to be protected in its integrity that must be no suppression, no alteration of the data. And we have to wonder if the conception of the algorithm, um, if when you, con you, con you create an algorithm, you need to be careful of all the potential bias that can be introduced in the conception. So the question is, um, is, is the trans is if the transparency of the conception and of the use of the algorithm must be uh, regulated? If so, how? To what extent? How do we monitor this uh, regulation? And how can we correctly be sure that it's very, it's um, really easy? So the question is first, do we need special regulation for the use of the data from judicial court decision in the French national level? And if so, how to do so? Do we choose 
to support freedom, to conduct all the business and let economic stakeholders regulate themselves? Do we choose to promote good behavior in the matter of judicial for decision data verification and let the stakeholders respect it, like this label, for example? That's supposed to trust them. That's supposed also to agree on the common rules of the ethical new rules of judicial for decision. Or do we need to do we think to control more precisely the regulation? And if so, what kind of authority can have this control? All these questions led the Court de Cassation, the French Ministry of Justice and the Conseil d'État, to create a task group on ethics of the judicial court decision that I will use, which starts with um, its uh, work in spring 2021. And the conclusion of the group will be known in short time. The second point is um, the fact that the large scale dissemination of judicial court decision will raise or might raise also the question of the consequences for the world of the judge and for our French conception of case law. We can ask ourselves what will be the role of a judge in a world where every judicial decision is entirely and directly within easy reach. Some predict that this situation will lead to change our civil law system to a case law system. For example, at this time nowadays, there are only um, 15,000 court rulings which are available online, and there is the court de cassation ruling. When the open data will be effective, we will know um, 3 million court rulings each year. So we will know precisely what each court has answered to each case brought to justice. In that regard, it raises the whole question that every judge is, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know for the time, but I'm almost finished. <laughs> Does every judge uh, uh, produce jurisprudence? And by being provocative, we can wonder if each and every decision is interesting in terms of lawmaking, of course, for all the parties, the decision is interesting, but in terms of lawmaking, this leads to the question, what gives the authority and what, and more important, what gives a normative force to a judicial decision? Is it the publicity or is it um, or other uh, criteria? And in this kind of criteria, we can, for example, um, thinking about the, the numbers of the decision, we decide that um, a decision is important because they have a, a, a lot of decision uh, in this kind of um, uh, of, um, of ruling. Um, it will uh, finally raise this uh, question and as a English you, you will understand, <laughs> will the open data in the judicial decision in France promote a, a, a hierarchy between the decision of from lower court with the difference between case law, precedent, and binding precedent, the way it exists in UK. That's, that's mm -hmm. a question. And that, this, this question has direct and practical consequences for each stakeholder, for the judges, for the lawyer, for the researcher, and also for the legal text, because depending on this solution, artificial intelligence and algorithm will be developed by the legal text um, to take into uh, this, uh, account the distinction between judicial decisions. So, es Estelle, to excuse me. To conclude? You, you're, <laughs> you're now 14 minutes. So okay, sorry. that's so. My, 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 my conclusion just to tell you that this issue is tackled by the Court of Cassation. We create a work group on the dissemination of decisional data and case law. Uh, it was created in July 2021, and it's led by two professors, Loïc Cadier and Cécile Chenet, and by a uh, president of the Chamber uh, of the Court de Cassation, Jean-Michel Thomas. And the conclusion of the work group will be known at the end of the So well, Thank you. Estelle, thank you very much. Uh, such interesting issues you've raised.
Um, we now switch to the British perspective and uh, to Natalie Byron. She is Director of Research at the Legal Education Foundation and Founder and Director of the Justice Lab Initiative. She is especially knowledgeable about the British court system and will address the importance of thinking more carefully about the use of AI and how it should be regulated. Uh, Natalie. Thank you so much, Michael. And I'd like to extend um, my thanks to everyone at the Society and to Anne for having me here today. It's such a pleasure to have a chance um, to join this panel. And it was really amazing to hear from the previous two presenters. So thank you. So as you said, my name is Dr. Natalie Byram. I'm Director of Research at the Legal Education Foundation. We are an independent charitable trust um, with an endowment of 200 million pounds. Um, and essentially every year, the foundation awards grants of between five and seven million pounds to frontline organizations who work to support some of the most vulnerable people in the UK to access the justice system. Um, as Michael mentioned in my introduction, I currently lead the foundation's Justice Lab initiative, which catalyzes and commissions robust research to build a justice system that works better for everyone. Key to delivering our vision in this regard is improving the quality and availability of data about the justice system and about the experience of those who rely on the justice system for protection. So between 2018 and 2020, I was seconded as expert advisor on open data um, to the court service in England and Wales in the context of an ongoing £1 billion programme of digital court reform. The reform programme, which will conclude next year, aims to completely overhaul our predominantly paper-based systems and replace them with digital end-to-end -end services for people to access and navigate the justice system from case initiation to hearing to resolution. The reform programme provides the opportunity and the infrastructure to radically rethink the way in which data about the justice system is collected, stored and shared. And that means everything from data about individuals um, to precedential data, so judgments and decisions. And the reform programme as a whole offers the prospect of new and better data to deliver the things that Michael indicated in his introduction that we all care about, better data to inform policy, to design and deliver better services, and to support innovation. It also offers the tantalizing prospect of expanding the role for AI and machine learning within the justice system. So what I'd like to say is whilst my particular experience is in the context of England and Wales, the issues that the court service and the government are grappling with here are global issues. COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption and integration of digital ways of working across justice systems worldwide. The 37th meeting of the Council of Europe, European Commission for the Digitalization of Justice in 2021, adopted an action plan for the next four years, which centers on the theme of digitalization for better justice. And France, as we've heard, is already a leader in this regard. With digitization comes the prospect of more granular data being available in readily downloadable formats than ever before, forcing us to confront tensions between open justice and individual privacy that have previously been managed by the practical obscurity of so much of this data being available in paper files and creating new opportunities and risks. So, Many of the frameworks governing the use of AI, including the European Commission proposal that Mathieu uh, described earlier, focus on risks as they relate to criminal justice. Um, I feel that the community as a whole has been chastened by high profile examples of projects that have exacerbated inequality and perpetuated bias in the US, things like the Compass tool or predictive analytics as deployed in sentencing. However, comparatively little attention is being given to the risks posed by AI in contexts outside criminal justice and the regulatory framework that should be deployed to manage these risks. And I guess the question is, why is it so important that we consider these and why is it so important that we consider these risks now? Well, Partly, the reason the risk is so important is because of the context that we're in. Successive global research projects and white papers have highlighted the huge access to justice gap for individuals seeking redress and resolution in areas outside of criminal justice. Civil, family and administrative justice processes determine access to fundamental rights that cut right to the heart of what it means to be a citizen and a person. They govern rules around housing, around education, around access to your children. 
And um, whilst these processes and the data that surrounds them tend to attract less attention than their criminal counterparts, they are no less important. In England and Wales, cuts to funding for legal aid, so state funded legal advice and assistance, have resulted in more people than ever before attempting to navigate the justice system without legal advice and representation. And in this context of reduced funding, policymakers are increasingly interested in the ways in which technology can be used to address these issues at lower cost, whether that's about designing digital systems which encourage mediation and early settlement to keep cases out of court, or from investing in the development of products that came to be able to mimic the relational expertise that's traditionally been provided by lawyers, so predicting outcomes in individual cases. Most recently in England and Wales, government funding was awarded to a tech startup to deliver a product that claimed to be able to predict case outcomes in the employment tribunal, which governs workplace disputes using publicly available data. So I guess what I want to say is that whilst the aim of democratizing access to legal services is undoubtedly laudable, and the challenge that we're all facing as a community of individuals who care about the justice system is no doubt stark. There are a number of risks that need to be managed if the justice system as a whole is truly to benefit from the potential of AI. A fundamental risk in this regard is created by our historic failure to in invest in developing a functioning and effective justice e data ecosystem. As a result, any technology, any AI that is built now will be based on patchy, incomplete, poorly structured data that has not been properly mapped. The best quality decision-making, the best quality data about judicial decision-making in England and Wales is held by private publishers. A recent study of decisions of the administrative court in England and Wales revealed that only 55% of decisions made by this court were available in the public domain, compared with the data that's held by public, private publishers. In this context, there is a real risk that the products developed and marketed will produce erroneous results, leading to misinformation, undermining access to justice for the individuals who rely on the justice system to deliver their fundamental rights and protect them from harm. As these products are necessarily based on historic data, there is a real risk that they will produce advice that replicates and entrenches existing biases. Left unregulated and in the absence of corrective incentive structures, there is a clear danger that these products will exacerbate rather than improve inequalities of power within the justice system. The best data relates to the commercial courts, and that means that there are incentives for all of the um, research and development to go into developing products in that space, leaving a rump for the rest of the justice system. A further risk is created by the failure to take action to explore what the public at large and users of the justice system in particular consider to be acceptable uses of justice data. Moving beyond public acceptability in this space presents clear risks and could serve to undermine already fragile trust in justice institutions, which in the context of England and Wales has only been exacerbated by Brexit. So what's the solution? Well, in short, I think we need to strengthen regulation um, around um, access to justice data. In health, it's well established under our existing legislative frameworks that the use of data, access to data about patients' health is only permitted for projects that advance public health. And I think we need to develop a similar standard and a similar approach in justice where applications for access to data about the justice system are determined according to their ability of the ability of a given project to advance the public interest in the administration of justice, equal access to justice and judicial independence. I think we really, uh, speaking to Estelle's point, um, I think this needs to be an empirical standard. And I think we need to hold the companies that are developing these products to account for the quality and design of their services. Self-regulation here is not the answer. We wouldn't accept it for the legal profession. So why are we accepting it for these, for these companies? One option as an interim measure could be investing in things like sandboxes to allow companies and researchers to experiment, publish their results openly. And this is how you get good science and reliable, um, reliable products that don't um, risk some of these fundamental issues. Um, I also think we need to invest in research and deliberation to understand what the public considers to be acceptable use of justice data and to explore effective models of participatory data governance. 
With these safeguards in place, we can ensure that increased access to data truly delivers its potential to, to increase access to justice and strengthens rather than undermines trust in our institutions. Thank you ever so much for letting me speak and I'm really excited to, um, for the question session. Uh, Nathalie, thank you. Uh, hold on, are, are you hearing me? Th thank you very much for your tour de force in such a brief uh, period of time, coming in even under 10 minutes. So well done. <laughs> uh, that brings me now to uh, Andrew Dunkley, who is the Technology Solutions Lead for the Alternative Legal Section Services Practice of the international law firm Herbert Smith Freehills. Herbert Smith Freehills has a preeminent reputation as the litigator you want to see on your side. Uh, Andrew will focus on the use of AI and machine learning in contentious matters and the importance of the quality and range of the data. Andrew. Thank you, Michael. And just to reassure you, I've got a stopwatch running, so uh, I'll go, go at speed. Um, and, and thank you all for, for your time. Um, as well as what I, what I do day to day, which is focused on technology design, I've also previously worked with data scientists um, and also published research with the London School of Economics around how you actually build these predictive models. So what I'm going to do today is try to give you, and I'll, let me just share my screen, try to give you a little bit of a practical um, perspective on some of the challenges um, that we're facing in building some of this stuff and also how as an industry we're going about solving it. Um, but first of all, let's touch on the, the fundamental sort of challenge that sits in this landscape. And that is that to build AI, you need a lot of data and it needs to be repeatable. Um, but in our disputes context here, actually, we don't have that many disputes. We're not Amazon. Amazon and eBay and you know, those companies have got tens of millions of repeated data points. In the legal sector, when we talk about claims and litigation and judgments, we've got tens of thousands at best. Um, and actually, we don't know very much about most of those, even where the data is published. Yes, we might have a judgment but we frequently won't have the, um, for example, the, the witness statements or the exhibits that have been analyzed in getting to that judgment. We may have partial ac access to the other judgments that, that is based on. And critically, we will never, from a public perspective, have access to the offers and counter offers that sit behind the negotiating process that almost always precedes it. Another challenge that we've got is this trade-off that we have between volume of data that we can use to build the models and complexity. What we tend to see is that there's an exponential decrease in claim volume or claim the volume of a type of claim at the same time as we have an exponential increase in the complexity and value and sophistication. Um, Put simply, there's an awful lot of road traffic accidents leading to whiplash type claims, and then very, very few high value complex commercial disputes. But the problem is that the, where these tools are expensive and novel, the, what the, a lot of the application would ideally be at the high value end. And that makes it quite difficult to find use cases to deploy this stuff. And then we focus in on the concept on what actually a, a judgment is talking about. And th this sort of these graphs are indicative, but this comes from some of my experience in the, um, in the UK insurance dispute sector. And, and what we see is that lawyers are actually only instructed on about 5% of claims. And within that, five, or not 5% of claims, 5% of potential disputes or arguments. But within that 5%, we might only um take through take a further five percent through to a trial and even fewer down to appeal so you have this situation where we know the most about disputes that get through to appeal but that those disputes are a fraction of the overall argument contentious landscape and arguably 
they're the ones where it's least useful to be doing prediction. You For this stuff to be valuable, you want to be attacking that great big block of general disputes on the left that n either never see lawyers or see lawyers but never see a judge. So, you know, just following on from that, why do cases go to trial? Well, it could be that there's a new issue of law. It could be finely balanced outcomes. There's a, you know, it's a real coin toss. It could be that you've got a party that's got their backs to the wall and can't afford to lose because they'll go bust or suffer catastrophic reputational damage. It could be that they've had bad advice or just overvalued their position. And, or it might just be that they're an argumentative um, type and they, they want to have their day in court. They, they're convinced that you know, a judge will see their side. What this tells us is that any dispute that sees a judge is necessarily an outlier. These factors are not normal. They're not run of the mill. They make any one of these things makes a claim unusual. And when you're building predictive AI models, you don't want unusual. You want, well, you want a bit of it, but you want a broad spectrum of representative claims that you can use to build the model. And the practical reality is that in terms of the data that we have available coming out of the judiciary, they're just not representative. Because if it's ever seen a judge, it's weird. And, and that's a real challenge when it comes to building um, AI systems. So as an industry, what are we actually doing to, to attack that challenge of finding good places to use that this new really powerful technology that we've got access to? Well, certainly in England and Wales, what we're seeing is that AI is developing fastest and being applied first in areas where we can find that volume of data. Um, and there's a few that I'd pick out. Firstly, where we do have those, relatively speaking, high volume of claims, um, so often lower value, um, often personal injury, personal injury related. Um, some of the testing that we did um, previously, we reckon that we, you need about a thousand similar claims before you can start training meaningful um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and those are a thousand factually similar claims. That's a big number in the context of, of a legal um, universe and the, the complexity of the data that we have. You know, even one of the things that, that I've learned is even really simple claims, when you actually sit down and dig into the decision-making process that lawyers go through, um, are very, very complex or relatively complex and sophisticated things. I think we picked out um, 40 different factual factors that a, law, that a lawyer would consider when assessing a, uh, a road traffic claim involving whether an accident was caused by somebody changing lanes, which is about the simplest civil dispute you can have. Um, other areas where we're seeing it happen are, are again in portfolio disputes. So class actions where there are tens of thousands or potentially hundreds of thousands of um, complaints about a single thing. That's a good use case for this sort of thing because the scale of a big class action, think of some of the Dieselgate stuff that's going around, um, the scale of the class action can justify bespoke machine learned models built on data from within the class that you've got more control over. And the other place that we're seeing this is around data heavy components of, of major disputes, um, particularly around volume document review and data extraction. Um, this overlaps with a lot of the non-contentious use cases around due diligence, where you're using artificial intelligence and natural language processing, not to make predictions about outcomes, but to extract structured data out of the complex unstructured data of the claim to either drive efficiencies or help you run the, the claim itself. So they're the areas where I think we're seeing AI go to first, because this is where we can find the data that's enough, where there's enough of it, where it's repeatable enough, and where we've got enough control over it to build tools that are useful. 
just digging into an example of one of those for a second, um, and this this comes from um, some work that I did previously in the UK insurance sector, building machine learned case assessment in the um, in the personal injury and road traffic space. Insurers are good for this because insurers as a client base, they're statistically sophisticated clients. They've got a lot of their own data. They deal with tens to hundreds of thousands of disputes every year, and they're professional litigants. So it was a really good proving ground to, to work with them to, um, to build this sort of um, tool. We were going after liability. Quantum is harder. It's always easier to forecast an outcome than it is to, to, to put value and number on a range. Um, but we, there, there were still challenges in finding big enough similar samples of data, access to historic data, even when we owned the data, because guess what? When we were creating this stuff five, 10 years ago, no one thought to store it right in a decent document management system or you know, and things aren't tagged. So you've got to go and tag them up. The law's a moving target. You know, the, the law changes. And as soon as the law changes by a big in a big enough way, then all of a sudden your AI model is broken and it can break tomorrow with no notice if there's a, a new judicial decision at high level that changes the area of law or if a new law is passed. And then there's that point that I made earlier about litigated cases necessarily being outliers. So you need to get find a way to get into the data for claims that never went to a judge. That's been a really high speed canter through, um, but there's a few thoughts that I'll, I'll wrap up with. Uh, and these sort of call back to um, Estelle Mathieu and Natalie's um, talks. The first is trust. We need to have a really honest conversation about how much we trust these things, when we should trust them, when we should uh, be, be more cautious. There's a difference. There's a there's a spectrum of trust ranging from here's what my tool says. You know, you might want to consider it through to here's what my tool says. You should do what it says unless your boss tells you not to. And here's what my tool says. I'm going to automate an action off the back of that. So depending on how, how trustworthy we think these are, things are, there's difference we can do. Everyone's afraid. Everyone's terrified of GDPR. They're terrified of using data the wrong way. But there's no practical guidance. Um, I'm crying out for a, um, a regulator that, tell, that gives me, and crucially my competitors, some guidance about what are the ethical and practical standards that I have to uphold. Standards. When we're judging AI, just remember, people tend to say, oh, if it's not 95% accurate, it's not good enough. That is completely wrong because you're comparing what your artificial intelligence tool can do to what a person would do. If your person is forecasting with 55% accuracy and your AI gets 60, the AI is winning. Whereas if your person is getting 80% accurate, so if your AI is getting 95% accurate, but the person gets it right every time, don't use AI. And then lastly, think carefully about the data you have, what it's good for, what, what weaknesses it's got, how it might change over time. Use that to understand whether you're looking at a problem which is amenable to an AI solution or whether good old fashioned human skills might be more appropriate. And, and with that, um, I'll look forward to the questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, it's uh, now my great pleasure to introduce Estelle Crowe, the French liaison judge in London since the 1st of September 2020, uh, and who's done so much to help bring this event um, to fruition. Uh, she is our rapporteur. Thank you very much uh, for our speaker, and uh, uh, thank you very much also um, uh, for the Franco-British Tata Society. It was just uh, great to hear this presentation, which tackled the real risks and challenges, especially the ethical challenges that the legal sector faces uh, due to the artificial intelligence developments and how the structure of the new European regulation of AA is fundamentally based on the concept of legal risks and legal levels. It was also very interesting to hear more about the practical side of implementing 
AA from uh, Andrew and from the uh, legal and industry perspective. Having heard a lot about the risks of uh, IA, I thought I would hand on a reflection on the advantages and the use of intelligence artificial as a complementary tools. So low tech and IA defined through the dichotomy of complementing and improving or replacing. Uh, low tech refers to technologies that are intended to complement or replace traditional methods of delivering legal services or that improve the functioning of the legal system. It's interesting to note uh, in this definition and indeed in the talks presented today, the dichotomy between the complementary and the improving nature of low tech and IA, and on the other side, the replacing nature of it. As mentioned by my friend colleague uh, Estelle, open data present risks for new conception of French case law and also raises the question of what will become of the role of judges. She's concluded that some predict it will encourage a replacement by judges uh, by algorithms. On the other side, we may ask what if algorithms could complement and strengthen the role of judges and be great tools also for the public's access as Natalie really highlighted in, in her presentation. Following Mathieu's presentation and example, um, and he showed how IA can improve the administration of justice by assisting judicial authorities in interpreting facts, for example, or it can help also the law enforcement. It is very interesting to see IA as a powerful tool which may help a judge recognize and analyze their own bias. And as such, it could be a great tool for the progress of decision making. In this way, AI would act in a complementary way instead of as replacement. On a diplomatic point of view, I would also mention that legal technology can be used as a tool in the strategy of influence, uh, especially in terms of regulation and in soft power perspective. The wear of data is not negligible, and when approaching the use of law in strategies of influence, it will be an advantage. New accessibility and ability to share and new soft law will have a big impact on the influence that these will have. As it has been raised by SL, my colleague, what gives something authority or at least greater power? Is it publicity or is it accessibility? In a comparative perspective, you using the legal um, industry, you will have some comparative perspective and sometimes you will have to choose uh, between national courts and access to open data will be very important in that, in that purpose. Platform will also display civil law and common law data. Information will be accessible to all. There will be great tools for professional users in the business to business area. This event, I think, also highlights the differences and the changes in different legal systems, civil and common law systems, as a result of intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. Esther, my French colleague, mentions that the French conception of case law may change as a result of the new accessibility to court rulings and how this shift may promote a hierarchy between decisions from lower courts with difference between case law, the precedent, and the binding precedent, as in the UK. It will be very interesting to see how AI developments will affect different judicial systems and legal systems differently. In conclusion, I would say that artificial intelligence can be seen as a new agent and or as a new tool on the scene. Depending on your view, you may see them as a colleague who has to help you or as someone who has instead come to replace you. Thank you so much. And I think it's, it's time for a question and answer. Thank you very uh, much, Estelle. Um, nicely put. Um, and while I'm thanking you, I would thank um, Anne Biosch, our General Secretary, who has worked so hard to organize us today 
along with uh, Fanny Mordon. So thank you. Now, we have time for questions. Um, so if you want to, raise, to do so, raise a hand. Now, I can't see on my screen everyone. So perhaps Anne could draw to my attention anyone who has raised their hand. I will do, will do if, um, as soon as I see some more hands. Thank you. Is there any question that one of the speakers would like to ask of another of the speakers? Well, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, hold on and chat. Um, no, I, I'm not seeing uh, anything more here. So mm -hmm. I think what we'll just do is finish the session um, promptly. Uh, Andrew, sorry, you wanting to say something? I was, there was just one thing I wanted to, um, to, to pick up on um, and, and it's sort of, Apposite, given that I know that I, it feels like um, this is an area where England and France have slightly different perspectives. You know, because Estelle, I know that you were you were talking about how um, there's a um, the, there's requirements in in France not to publish um, judgments unless they've been properly redacted. Um, whereas in England, I know we we very much take the perspective that. If you're in front of a judge because a courtroom is a, is largely publicly a public forum, then once it's in front of a judge, you should expect it to be um, to be public. Do you think that though that sort of different cultural or institutional approach to um, the um, public availability of, of documents relate or information relating to disputes will sort of continue and carry on diverging, or do you think that? Um, the, the potential advantages of this sort of technology will start to bring us together. Mm. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, um, I understand the, the, the point of view um, from, from the UK when you said that um, because you, 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 you go to the court, you, you, you have to accept that all your personal uh, information will be made public. That's, that's what we say. Yeah. Broadly speaking, that's the, the case in, yeah. in, in yeah, the that, that, yeah, yeah. some areas of the family courts and that kind of thing. Yeah, but um, I think that uh, in France, uh, this uh, point of view is, um, is, is not the case. And I'm not sure that uh, it will be. Uh, it will be the case someday. Uh, to be honest, um, we have, as, 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 I, as I talked about, we, we have the, the core uh, anonymization, uh, which was um, created by the law. And we are not sure that uh, when we use only the, the core anonymization, uh, we are in comply to the obligation of the um, um, how is it in English? Um, the, the, the reglement in the, in the European Union, uh, RGPD, GPRD, RGPD, Estelle, I don't know how to say it in English. There's, you know, um, a, a legislation on the European level that we, we protect all the private information for. Uh, for natural body, and we we are not quite sure that if we don't uh, remove all this kind of uh, information, as I, I said about, like the address, the, the, the date of birth, and everything, we, we comply to, to to the European legislation. So I, I don't know the, the many minutes I, I can say. Um, so I'm not sure that we we can, you know merge of this, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this respect, but I know that uh, other countries are your way of thinking. Um, but no, I'm not sure we can do you that. Know, so. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see that Christophe Lelanou, who is the co-founder of, of this society, has 
raised his hand and wants to ask a question. Christoph. Hi, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks for the speaker for your great presentations. I have a question, maybe more for Mathieu, about the evolution of the re regulation in uh, Europe. So do you think the, because I guess you are following as well, maybe what's going on in, in the England as well. Do you think uh, England as well is going, the regulation in England as well is going to change or are we going to start to see some divergence in terms of regulation between uh, Europe and uh, England and Wales and the United Kingdoms? Um, it's a very good question. For sure, the regulation as it is currently negotiated will not apply directly in the UK. Um, for sure, also, one of the objectives of the regulation is to be able to capture market players and stakeholders, even though they are located outside of the EU, so British stakeholders can still be concerned and, and, and impacted by this regulation to the extent they use AI system that has an effect in the EU, even though the, the, this criteria is still very blurry because it can mean many things. I don't know how the UK honestly uh, is going to re react. Will they, is, is it going to, to try to have a similar or equivalent regulation? To my knowledge, they haven't started discussions around enacting a similar reform, but, but, but maybe, I mean, some people. We've done some work on this at the foundation, Mathieu, if I may. So yeah, there are, I think we are fully expecting um, that there will be regulation of AI in general, not that, and I think at the moment, what we're stuck between, um, if I may, is kind of the politics versus the pragmatic approach, because obviously it makes sense for us to, if we want to be able to trade, to bring ourselves into line. But I think there is, there's a framing issue here around wanting to be able to be, we've made AI a big feature of our industrial strategy, or it was as part of a manifesto commitment um, for the government that's currently um, in place. Um, practically, whether the desire to have something that is kind of branded global Britain will trump the clear pragmatic case for making sure that we're as closely aligned with Europe as possible. I guess it, I guess it remains to be seen. There've been a number of consultations, but I think it's fair to say that um, we are still, that, that's the kind of nature of the challenge that I think we're facing down in this jurisdiction. I, I think, sorry, I think there's also a, a distinction possibly here between artificial intelligence generally and artificial intelligence as applied to the legal system because the legal system is almost you know is is so focused on it's within your jurisdiction um and the the practical reality of this sort of tool is that if you're talking about predicting you're working on um judgment data then it is you know within it's bespoke to that jurisdiction um some of the other tools that we're seeing come up around data extraction are more are more general i was playing with a tool yesterday that is um you know has, has sort of is used for pulling data out of documentation and that that can be applied to english french german documents etc so it'll again it'll depend on the use case um, to an extent as to as to how much it Im that it impacts um, tools that are being built over here. Um, Natalie, Natalie had to, to leave, so that's why she's not answering back. She had a, a call from her boss, so she's... Um... But she came back in again, didn't she? Just a moment ago. Yes, but she had to leave, I think. That's what uh, and again, okay. Um, all right. Um, any more questions? Okay. In which case, I think uh, I, I will round this up now and thank everyone uh, very much indeed for joining us. I think it's been Sorry, incredibly. Oh, hello. Yes, we have someone else who would like to speak, Debira. Uh, well, I had a question for Natalie, but she's uh, she's gone, so I, I don't know if anyone else can answer the question. But it's um, 
she, she referred in her presentation to the um, failure to construct a suitable data ecosystem in the justice system. And I was wondering, you know, what she meant by that, what are the failures specifically, but uh, uh, she's not here to ask anymore. <laughs> We talked about a bit from a, a, a UK perspective. Um, I, I don't know whether there's there's sort of um, a comparable French side, but within within the UK, we're still very very um, paper based in terms of how we submit information into the legal system. Um, so there's some electronic reporting out of it, but if you want to go and see find information about a particular claim, you literally have to walk to a court building, pay a £35 fee, and somebody will go and rummage through filing cabinets. Um, so that's, you know, obviously when it comes to building tools and services that rely on the data, even if it's, whether it's public or whether it's private, um, the fact that it's not stored correctly, it isn't categorised correctly, we have our leading, um, our leading non-private um, case reporter is effectively a charitable foundation um, that, that, is rely, that relies on goodwill of, of, you know, of, of others to provide court judgments to the general public. Um, you know, it's been historically underinvested in. And, um, you know, those, I think, are some of the, the historic failings that you know, we're trying to, to wrestle with, um, certainly in the UK. Yes, so I, I would add, it's not just the ecosystem around digital matters. Our courts are crumbling. Many a court has got a bucket on the floor with water being collected. And we are, uh, the, the system is being starved by the government of funds. Uh, they like to talk a lot about bringing people to justice, but actually the delays in getting things to court are so long that witnesses have forgotten what happened and the victim of the crime is denied of justice, as indeed is the person accused who may be wrongly accused and they are denied of justice a long time. So I think there's, there's the theory of getting the ecosystem uh, up and running against the reality of a system that's just not delivering fun, funding for a key element of civil society. Rant over. <laughs> So, um, all right, uh, I think it is time to go now. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I hope you'll see, uh, come back again. Our next um, event that we're planning is on regulation, which may sound the same as justice, but it's not, although it will have a legal element in it. So, but more of that next time round. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, good afternoon to you all.